Hi, good afternoon, TEHF702 and TEHS702. Welcome to semester two and it's week two coming up. There are going to be two um, occasions for you to hear me this week. Um, it's the canned recording, the integrated grammar assessment um, canned recording now. And then I'm going to speak to you on the 10th. Um, it's going to be an SS1 contextualized grammar assessment overview. So please join me if with my um, Zoom call um, this week. And we're going to go over the assessment um, in detail. And if you have any queries, you can then bring them to the fore so we can chat about them. So this is one way for you to become involved with your SS deliveries um, and increase those marks. So welcome again. It's been a glorious um, winter's weekend here in Port Elizabeth. Um, hasn't been cold. Um, nice sunshine, good getting out weather, um, and let's get started with this next Women's Day week um, where we can celebrate um, everything about our moms, our wives, our partners, and all the special women in our life. Okay, and my female students, especially to you as well. So I'm going to share my screen with you, and let's get going with the PowerPoint. Okay, there we go. Um, so get rid of that. Yes. Integrated grammar teaching because we no longer teach grammar as isolated rules because as Cummins says, it's at the tip of the iceberg. And as Krashen says that those rules soon melt away and are forgotten. What we do is we integrate grammar teaching in a contextualized way with our speaking, our reading, our listening, um, and our writing. So it becomes part of what we do. We don't do reams and reams of worksheets, which mean nothing to our students. They can do them, but they can't apply them. But they see how grammar is actually being used in real, authentic texts. So if you get excited about grammar, which I can see some of you are, um, you're excited about idioms, speech, um, direct and indirect speech rules, active and passive, language use, um, communication, syntax, um, preposition use. Um, but if you're excited about that, that's fine because you can now take it to the next level, um, increase proficiency in your students, as well as a very strong understanding of how grammar works within text um, in the language um, arena. Okay, so if you look at this little um, visual here, um, if you're doing adjectives, for instance, is to make it very applied. Let them take um, a piece of paper, fold it up like a fan, and then they can write things about themselves to describe them, the adjectives. You don't say it's adjectives, you say to describe yourself. And the one on the left says he's brave, hopeful, brown, determined, and cheerful. We've got tall, caring, confident, generous, and independent. And the one on the right says I'm friendly, clever, young, loving, and gentle. And they can take those words and then compose a little paragraph about themselves, but it makes it a fun way to actually expose who they are. Um, they can be fun about how they actually unravel that fan and they expose it to the class. Okay, right. So we have got two um, informal surveys on hey, how many happy, happening on week one, um, the quick links, um, the mentee, how are you feeling today, as well as the Kahoot quiz. Okay, so I went and checked yesterday and um, a few of you have answered. And if I look at this, I can see that excited seems to be the prevalent word, which makes me excited as well. But on the just beyond that, we've got anxious and nervous. Um, so I'm sorry about those people who are anxious and nervous. I hope those feelings fade and that you start feeling excited as well. I'm glad some people are ready, energized, optimistic, um, committed, anticipatory, accelerated, thankful, um, positive, determined. Um, Hope those who are tired get overly tired and those who are angry, I'm sorry, I don't know why you're angry. Um, and uh, what else is there? There's a negative. Nervous. Um, so I think there are quite a few positive words going there, which makes me feel quite encouraged as well. So the quiz has happened. It's the informal um, fun quiz, which you can um, answer after you've listened to my opening and welcome. And I see 94 of you already playing the Kahoot quiz. I'll quickly get a quick look. I'll do this. I think it closes on the 13th, but I'm just going to check the closing date. And I see Grisha still at the top of the pops with um the quickest 10 marks, the quickest time. And he's also got 10. I think the top three all have got 10 out of 10 anyway. But it goes about speed that you answer and whether you get them right or not. But we'll check this again um, at, when it closes. Um, so well done for you to those 94 players who are now up and running on Kahoot and have actually played the game. Okay, which is quite fun. 
I can also start in my spreadsheet as well for uh, semester two. Um, the last I looked at it yesterday, there were 91 FET, um, or that should be home language students, not FAL students, and there's 104 SPs. Um, 13 of you have done the week one uh, online tracker and 14 for the SPs, but I think you've gotten from 13th to complete it. So I'm sure those reds will turn to black. Uh, so I don't think I need to be concerned yet. Um, week three is the week after this. Um, there's going to be a forum discussion. Um, then we'll, you'll see that we only have five um, online trackers. We'll have another one in week five, week six, and week nine. Then your SS1, SS2, and SS3. Basically, the end of August, end of September, end of October um, is when those will be due. Yes, so that's it all. Um, you can see it's a lot less work. So hopefully you've been more exhilarated about that as well. So what about the assessments? That horror look in your face. Yes, you can see they're all 22nd and the 24th. And I think I made a bit of a mess up the, the dates. Thank you, Mari, for letting me know. And I went and checked it. Um, the 22nd of every month, August, 22nd of September, 22nd of October, all the FETs. Um, those are your submission dates. You're the early one now. And the SPs have got the 24th of each time. 24th of August, September, and October. When your, your um, process writing is due in SS2, will be September and the examination setting is due in October. With the contextualized grammar assessment happening now, it's only 25%. And I'll be discussing this in detail in my Zoom class on the 10th. I think it's, it's I'm not sure if it's half past five or quarter to five. Anyway, I'll check again. But if you can be there, I'd love to see you and interact with you. Otherwise, it will there will be a, a recording and I will upload the PowerPoint as well. Okay, just to, just to confirm those weightings, your participation, which is your five online trackers, is 10% of your mark. SS1, 25. SS2 is 30. SS3 is 35%. Please just note that your SS3s will always remain hidden. Um, you'll always see your SS1s and SS2, but when your marks are released at the end of the year in December, you will be able to see your SS3 mark as well. Okay, any questions about that? Please get back to me as well. So let's just have a look at um, SS1 quickly, a quick overview on this page. And um, what you're going to have to do is maybe even start looking now to find a topical. That means it's something that's very relevant. 2023, that means it's this year. Something local, that means it's South African. It's not from Europe or North America or Australia. It's local, yeah, South Africa. And it's, it's persuasive. So it's got a topic of, so, of social interest um, in South Africa. There's anything from load shedding to cholera, to, um, to financial issues that you could actually bring into this. Um, but it must have a picture as well. So if it's a news report, it'll always have some kind of picture as well. Um, you're also going to design this assessment um, using different questions that are using different cognitive levels. So you will be expected to have the high cognitive levels and the low cognitive levels according to Bloom or according to CAPS. Then you're going to do a marking guide for that as well. So that's all part of it. I think that's 10. That's 10. I think the, the, the actual choosing of your text is 10, but the design of the actual assessment is out of 20. It's a social issue. As you can see, there's so many things happening in South Africa. There's also the, the elections happening next year, which you can also bring in as a social issue. So this is an article from 2023. And you're also going to have to reflect. This is, I think it's a 10 mark section on reflections where you're going to talk about whether you should teach grammar implicitly or explicitly, please go and check out, and there's a whole section of it in, in um, Ferreira, you can get to talk about this, why should we teach it implicitly or, or and explicitly. And then you're also going to design a grammar task, which is integrated um, to guide a teaching FET or SP phase. So that'll be five marks and five marks. Um, so remember we did that in, in, in week one, I asked you to do, think about how you would actually teach maybe parts of speech using a visual, how would you explain it to a teacher how to do that? The last thing we do on this page is looking at in this scanned recording, I'm going to look at something in Ferreira, maybe you want to teach vocab. So that's something you could also think about that question, but we'll talk about that as well. Okay, so we're into unit one. Um, and as you know, last week, we looked at the importance of teaching language structure and use. And this week is the integrated grammar teaching strategies that we can do to integrate grammar into reading, writing, listening, and speaking. So are you confused about this? Because you thought grammar was just about teaching verbs and tenses and direct and indirect speech. What's this all about integrating grammar into 
speaking, reading, and writing. But you know, that's all what's going to happen this afternoon. So if you look at this little um, insert here, if you think about the study of traditional school grammar, which is always rule-based, the teachers taught you the rules, um, and research has shown this has no effect on raising the quality of student writing. So if you know all the rules of tense and passive and active voice, you will not be still an effective writer of English. So that's what, why we have to be more integrated. Students, learners have got to see how it actually happens within all kinds of different texts so they can apply that in their writing, their reading, their listening, and their speaking. So keep that in mind. More details on this, go to, to the whole of chapter 13 is good in Pereira, but this refers to page 194 on Pereira. Um, in the next two weeks, then we'll look at uh, resources for, for grammar, and then we'll look at assessment of grammar as well. So remember, <laughs> grammar teaching is not an isolated rule-based activity, all right? It's integrated, it's contextualized. Um, it's best done in context, as I said. That means with some kind of text, whether it be a, a listening text, a speaking text, a reading text, or a writing text, or a visual text. So if you want to teach tenses and word classes, anything specific, it's got to be part of the text that the learners are busy producing, what they're speaking or writing about, or what they are encountering, what they're listening to or reading. So it's not taking an isolated, I want to teach the past tense, so I'll go and get a newspaper report because many examples of past tense use in that. There's also examples of um, active and passive voice, lots of exam examples of direct and indirect um, speech. Um, so there's so much I could get if I just look at a newspaper article so I can see those language specific aspects in the text. Okay, we'll look at lots of examples today. So don't forget the input processing for language proficiency that this is the structure we're using. Um, if we've got out of context grammar, that means you're not using text-based grammar exercises. Um, so what we're teaching has got no connection to authentic texts or authentic writing. This will lead to student disengagement. They won't be participating or understanding. They will be honing out. They won't be listening to you because they will find this terribly boring because it's not relevant to them. It's not exciting at all. And he has a nice little link, how to teach grammar five best practices, is which I'm looking at today. So research indicates that learners' proficiency improves. Your proficiency will improve when you encourage discussion about grammar items. So you're going to get a newspaper and you speak about the direct and indirect speech and the effect of it. Why did they use the words of the speaker there. Why did they not use the words of the speaker there? Why was it indirect? So you talk about it. And they must be able to have read it, heard it, spoken it, or written about it. You talk about things that are in context, that are integrated. And this will push the learners to process these grammar structures um, with your input, the way you've structured it in how you're accessing those past tense, the present tense, the future tense, active and passive types of language that we need our learners to know about. In learner-centered classrooms, so it means you're getting your students to work in groups, they're talking, they're peer sharing, not teacher telling all the time, okay? We get tired of teacher voices, like you're getting tired of mine, I'm sure. So learners need to learn grammar implicitly and explicitly. Please go and look at implicit and explicit learning from Pereira chapter 13. This is one of the things you're going to reflect on in your SS1 as part of the reflection for five marks. Must we learn grammar implicitly or explicitly? Explicitly must I teach them the rules? Implicitly means I learn the rules from observing how they are used in text. So think about that. Okay. Yes, but remember that the language journey that we're going to go through to learn a language, become more proficient in it, is far more complicated than the simple grammar rules that we do. And students are quite good at doing those grammar exercises. I know my students could do reams and reams and reams of them, um, but they could never apply them per perfectly into their writing exercises or their speaking um, in the class. And there are lots of free freebies around. I've got the link here for you if you can like these free grammar worksheets, um, how to use wood adjectives, um, free adjectives worksheets. You go and get them, go and load down. There is the busy teacher, how to integrate grammar and writing, which is a good thing, but you can go get lots of free worksheets. Um, so 
remember, even if your students know all the rules, okay, when it applies those rules into writing, they fall short. Now, why does this happen? So you might want to think about it. I think it's because teachers separate grammar from writing. Um, for whatever we learn in grammar, we should write about it. So they're not two separate things. It's learning that rule. It's applying the rule, but it's also writing about the rule. So it's not a separate thing from your actual learning of the rule. So how do we teach grammar? Hmm? Something to think about. I'm going to give you some strategies to make writing a part of the grammar class. This is how you internalize and acquire many of those rules. So this is something for you to think about. So you have some grammar tips. Um, there are five of them. I'm going to go through them. There's some, some of them will do about five slides per tip because there's so much. Um, so you provide models and examples as teachers. You make sure your, your learners write every day, even if it's only one sentence. You design your lessons with your learner in mind. So that means the content, the texts are all relevant and authentic to the learners. It's not something that is unknown to them, that they're going to be interested in, that they're going to find exciting. And also design with your rubric in mind, your grammar. So if you've got a, a writing piece, have a section for the grammar, what you have grammar you want them to include. So make them mindful of that. So in this set, in this piece of writing, I'm going to look at spelling, punctuation, and um, say verb use. Okay. And you mark them for that. And the other one you might say, I'm going to use this. I'm only marking you for using complex sentences and compound sentences. You get zero for simple sentences. So those are things you could do to integrate your rubric into the grammar and especially in writing. And you can use pictures. The last one is pictures. Pictures are fantastic. You can do so many with pictures. If you've got all newspapers or magazines in your class, you can do this kind of exercise very easily. So the first tip is to provide examples and models as a teacher. So when you introduce a grammar concept like a present continuous, for instance, Show the students a model of a paragraph or text that illustrates the use of the present continuous, for example, or active and passive voice or um, direct and indirect speech. And for instance, we've got, we've got Women's Day coming up on Wednesday. Um, he has an article as kind of a persuasive um, social message you could use for SS1 um, with Women's Day and things that are happening in South Africa on the 23rd, uh, 9th of <laughs> 9th of 9th of August 2023. Um, we can have a look at the use of present and I'm saying I'm getting all tongue-tied now, direct and indirect speech. You can do this by giving them the article and maybe asking them to go in groups and highlight which is active and which which is direct and which is indirect. Or you can do it for them and you can say to them, why do you, why is this direct and why is this indirect? Here's an example. Um, it said that there was little to celebrate on Women's Day while injustice against women continued. Okay, now if you want to say, is this direct or indirect, they must explain why. And you can actually say to them, okay, now change this to direct speech. Um, in this example, you can see that we've used inverted commas. Um, you can say, why is this direct speech? Let them understand the rule. Let them talk about it in their groups. And then you can say, okay, let's now change this to indirect speech. And here's another example of indirect speech or direct speech. So let the learners study the bold or highlighted sections um, and say why these sentences are written the way they are. Why are they, why did they use direct speech or why did they use indirect speech? This makes it very contextualized that you're not just looking at the structures, you're not just changing the structures, but you're saying why were the direct words used or why were the indirect words used? the reporter's speech use. So think about things like that. So you're still providing your examples and models. Um, so for indirect and direct speech, you also show them two copies of the same article, one with direct and one with indirect speech. And let them compare and contrast these two and work, try and figure out those grammar rules underlying the concept. What tenses are used? What punctuation is used? What do they do with pronouns? What do they do with... Um, with the place, here, there, now, then, how do they use time, all those adverbs. Alternatively, you can show them a text after you've introduced the grammar concept to the students. So if you've already taught them what direct and indirect speech are, then you can give them the text and ask them to identify and explain the rules. Um, so they can find the examples um, that you've just taught. For instance, um, there's another Women's Day um, article. 
<clears throat> Ramapola says, um, is that present or past? Is oh, we're present past on the brain? Direct and indirect speech. Um, what about this one at the bottom? President Saraposa said that the struggle of the South African woman was not yet done. Present or past? Oh, direct or indirect? Sorry, I must concentrate. Um, and then possibly ask him to change the one to direct and the one to indirect. There's another one. And you can see straight away if they were to tell you this, is this direct or indirect? They were straight away said, got use of inverted commas. And they've got the president said. Um, the use of there, they look at the pronoun use, they're looking at the time use, and they can actually explain it to you. So, so, so often provide your models and examples to teach tense as well. For instance, you want to teach the present continuous tense, so you go and get a TED talk. You know, I like TED talks, and this is quite a nice one. Um, you can compare and contrast the present simple and the present continuous because you can do the transcript from the TED talk. And you can say to them, okay, now go and change these to the past simple or the past continuous and explain what the difference is going to be in what the message is. And he has a delightful little TED talk. Um, the, the link is there. Um, TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat, and the rise of the bite-sized content. Um, we don't like to listen to too long things. That's why I'm sure most of you fast forward whatever I'm saying. But yeah, this eight minutes is perfect and you can listen to what she's saying. Then underneath, they've also got the transcripts, which you could actually copy. And then you could have a look at all the use of the present continuous, is falling, are uploading, are facing, is using, is making. You can go through a whole lot. And then you can say to them, I'm just gonna go back again. Say to them, okay, now go and change all those to the past simple. What difference does that make? Well, change it to the past continuous. Um, then you can go and get other words and other things. So there's lots that you can do if you've got text as well. So tip one. Um, whether you use text before instruction or after, so that means if you use text before you've told the rule or after you've used the rule, um, make sure that these contexts are realistic um, to your learners that they understand why they're doing it. That's not out of context. Was this critical for them to see these contexts in the text to be able to understand the use? Um, if they can't understand these patterns that you're trying to explain, like I was showing you all the use of the present continuous in the previous slide, and they don't understand how that grammar rule has been applied, they'll not be able to move beyond basic draw work. So they won't be able to use it in writing either. So they're going to battle there. So seeing grammar in other people's writing empowers learners to become more confident in using the structures in their own writing. So they saw in that um, TED talk how they use the present continuous all the time, they might be able to transfer that into their own writing as well, which will get them to practice it as well. And that's the way to do it, okay? So here yeah, we want to tip two, um, two writings a day keeps the errors away. So after producing and practicing a grammar concept, give the learners a short informal writing task to illustrate the, the grammar concept. So if you've done indirect speech, ask them to do a little dialogue with direct speech as well. Um, so they can practice the use of punctuation, they can inverted commas, the changing of pronouns, the changing of time, the changing of tense. So they could write something about this. They must practice it to apply it. So you can do this by giving them a prompt, which will elicit a certain grammar structure and get them to produce the grammar, which is more natural than the sentence draws that you might give them. So for instance, these are a whole lot of prompts. And um, 187 says, think of a present that you received that you didn't like, okay? How did you react? And did the person suspect you didn't like it? So these are nice little things to chat about. What did you do when you received a present you didn't like? Okay, what tense is that? The straight away they have to use the past tense. Um, I hated the person. I disliked the present intensely. Um, I shouted at my mother. I, um, I cried. <laughs> it's whatever you did. Um, did the person know that you didn't like it? The person knew I hated it. Okay, all right, so you, you tell... Well, the person was aware that I did not like that kind of person. So those are kinds of things you could say. In this next one, um, let me just get here. This is, describe the most insecure person you know and what makes him insecure. So that's something present tense. The most insecure person I know is my sister. She always cries, okay? She um, can't sleep at night. Um, she is miserable, okay? She... Um, 
won't go she will no oh, won't go out she likes to stay at home okay all right it's your present tense that you're using all the time what makes him so secure um she she was she um she hates watching scary movies and that makes her insecure whatever the reason is but you can try and keep it in the present tense um think of the most miserable person you've ever met devise a plan to cheer them up even if it's only for a short time Okay, what will you do? So we're using future tense now. I will take them a cake. I will go and cheer them up with my stories. I will visit uh, I will visit them. I will buy them a present. So using the will all the time to show what you're going to do. Here's the last one. Think of a time when you found out that people have been talking about you. What did they say about you? Um, what were they saying about you? They said that I was. Um, they made me feel very terrible. Okay, so those were using the past tense about what happened with you when you found that out. Okay, this is a tip two still. Um, tip a day keeps the errors away. By writing frequently in your class every day, you're building up learners association between grammar and writing. So they've seen how it is actually happening. It doesn't have to be long things. It could be just one sentence at the end of your lesson to illustrate that they know how the direct and indirect speech works. Also emphasizing writing more than the grammar in the class enforces that the language learning is not simply memorizing rules. So if I rather focus on the writing rather than the grammar, they will realize that they don't need to know and understand those rules. I think this comes out from the traditions of teaching that we've come through, that they think the knowing of the rule is so important. So the only rule is, yes, no rules. Okay, so we're still keeping our, teach, our students in mind with our writing a day um, to correct or not to correct. Is that the question? So what you could do if you've got a writing composition class, you can, you can or whatever they write, you can go and make notes of all the type of errors that are occurring. And so you could jot them down from papers they've handed in. And you make up a little warm-up worksheet with listing all those errors, making sure they know that everyone's error is there and that everyone makes mistakes and that there's a there's an error from every learner. Let them go then through the workshop work worksheet, changing them, correcting them, and then go back to their own writing and try and fix it up things that they've been doing incorrectly in their writing from seeing how it was activated here. And that will cause less frustration in your class. They won't get all irritated, irritated with things getting wrong. <coughs> so we can also teach keeping our, our rubric, I can't see my heading here, but my rubric in mind. Okay, so if I'm teaching, I think about my rubric all the time. How can I include it? Um, what happens is that learners often don't want to do complicated sentence structures. They keep it simple, so everything is a simple sentence because it makes it safer and they're not going to get things wrong. But you've rather got to encourage them to use more complex sentences and compounds um, rather than to stick to the simple sentences with one verb. Um, so if I design my rubric to address these specific points for grammatical structures, um, they will, you, we will probably see more complex sentences. If they know they can get higher marks if they're using more complex sentences, they'll be more daring and they will try and use those. So this is an example of a rubric that we could have. There's very good, good in developing. So grammar and sentence structure has got a part on this rubric. The sentences are clear and easy to understand. Each sentence contains one idea and there are few grammatical errors. There's another one, level four being the highest, it was actually, and then level, level one being the worst, so we can look at grammar. And this one's just looking at uh, limited errors in capitalization, punctuation, and spelling, whereas level one will have many errors in capitalization, punctuation, and spelling. So we're only looking at those things, we're not looking at anything else. Or if you look at sentence fluency, um, the emerging writer, We'll have very short sentences or starting with the same word, the, 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 maybe. Whereas the more proficient um, writer, the strong writer, will have many sentences which begin differently and very lengthy and transitional words. They've got a flow and a rhythm, so they will obviously get a higher mark. So often we can also tell, uh, using the rubric, say, what is the minimum number of structures I want you to use in your writing? So for instance, if you're writing a narrative essay, I want to see five examples of the past perfect, had done, the use of had and the past tense of the verb. Um, they must use that. Or you can implement a system of points which rewards them for using certain structures. For instance, um, if they have they only get one point for every simple sentence they use, 
or they get five points for every compound sentence they use, or they get 10 points if you use a compound complex sentence. And in this way, you can actually encourage them to use these more complex sentence structures. Okay, they like the text. But remind students that the more complex your sentence structures are, the more marks you usually get in essay writing, and they should begin practicing for that as well. Especially in IELTS too, the essay writing, the more complex compound sentences you have, the video writing is assumed to be. So you go to the girl, she goes to the dad, she says, daddy, would you like, do you like my picture? And he says, first of all, honey, you want me to be objective, that is fair. I have to create a rubric because I'll have to judge it against something. And so this is how we can be fairer with our assessment of grammar as well. This is the last tip, thankfully. You expect just to elicit writing. So some grammatical structures are difficult to bring out in expository writing. But what we can do is we can practice the present continuous, which is not frequently used compared to the present tense with the use of pictures. So to elicit a range of tenses, you can use pictures in your classroom, and that's easy. Go and get magazines, newspapers, ask them to cut out pictures. So depending on the grammar structure you're busy teaching, the writers give the pictures give the writers the freedom to practice virtually any kind of tense that you want them to do. For instance, yes, something to, from news today in Cape Town. Please investigate after a boy of 16 uses control of the car that slams into a cyclist. And then you can ask them what has happened. He has bashed into a tree. He has overturned his car. He has a dent in the side of his car. So, so you could speak about this and you're using the present perfect all the time. Um, what has happened? There's another one. Picture also from news today. What will you tell your mother and or your friend? Primary schoolers raise enough money to build 73 penguin nests. What we owe to my mother that I heard about the school that did this. So you, you're using the present tense, the future tense. Cyril and visits Anthony Blinken, or he's visiting Cyril, and you say, what were they doing? They were discussing state matters. Okay, so I'm using the past continuous there as well. So using the picture, give them the prompt, and they can use the tense. Uh, <clears throat> this is from BBC News. I got this this week, especially because I'm very interested in the moon, and this is the sturgeon moon. Um, they called the sturgeon moon because of the fish in the in, in, United, in North America, which... Uh, were just very great numbers because of this moon time. <laughs> the moon was better to see in the UK in the Northern um, Hemisphere. And um, this was on the 1st of August. I think it was 31st and the 1st of August. It was this beautiful moon. And uh, you could say what is happening. The moon is rising. Okay. The moon is full. So you could see all this thing. The moon is waxing, waning, whatever you want to say to them. Here's another picture of the Sturgeon moon. Another one of the Northern areas. I think this was Malta. Um, and yes, I think that this was somewhere in Iraq, I think, uh, or Turkey. Um, there we are. Here's another beautiful picture of the sturgeon moon. Those of you that are interested in the moon, at the end of the month, there's going to be a blue moon. So at 31st of August, you can look out for that as well. So we can also use pictures of celebrities and stories about celebrities, um, looking at comparisons. Comparisons using words similar, same, uh, or co contrast, different to, um, not the same, um, contrary. However, all those things that are different. Yes, yeah, so one about Steve Jobs. Um, if you're going to have a movie worksheet on him, um, you could read this one I've said here. Um, there's six quotes, and then there's like a point form summary, which they have to fill in from listening to the actual um, movie. Um, and there's also a key worksheet. And then here we've got Steve Jobs using a picture to make sure they know he is, and it's Apple man. And here are the six quotations they're going to go through and discuss. And you can see there's a whole worksheet on listening to the movie. Um, you could discuss these quotations. My job is not to be, my job is not to be easy on people. I'm not going to be easy on people. My job is to make them better. Okay. And here's another one. Um, don't let the noise of other people's opinions drown out your own inner voice. So don't listen too much to other people. Listen to your own voice. So chatting about it and what tenses will be used. Yes, direct speech, how do we look at it? Um, also, go to People magazine or any other magazines you know and look for celebrity pics. Um, um, use celebrity photos to spark comparisons. As Arnold Schwarzenegger is taller than Tom Cruise. is also bigger, um, those kinds of comparisons. But Tom is the better act, actor. And then we've got maybe none of you know who Arnold Schwarzenegger is. Maybe you all do know who Tom Cruise is. Um, you could compare them as well. 
but you'd also get them to go and get their tactics that they like, their songwriters, their songs, um, see what they've got to say. Let them find two pictures of two people that they think are different or the same and to compare them or to contrast them. Yeah, I got this from the Netflix, um, just to download it quickly. These are new movies and shows, Retribution, Guardian Galaxies, Hidden Strike, um, Little Mermaid, Book Club, all those. I haven't seen any of them, not sure if you have, but then to get them to talk about what they would like to see, which one they think is the better one, which one they think is not such a good movie. What do they think about that? And these are the, this, the comedy series, um, things like Seinfeld, which I like, uh, Screen, which I like. Also like The Office, Everybody Loves Raymond, all the things they can watch, which one they like, which they don't like, which they think is stupid, which they think is better to compare and contrast. They can do this in tables, put the ones they like on the one side, the ones they don't, but let them compare and contrast them. Oh, great one is phones, okay? Um, comparing Apple to to um, to anyone. I, I think there's only one for me, and that is Apple, but a lot of people like different kinds of ones. The Samsungs, let them talk about the different kinds of phones they like and compare them and contrast them. So still using pictures, um, we can go to this lovely picture of this person who's very emotional. Um, so you get them to get pictures of people that are showing emotions. So for person continuous again, ask him to describe what is happening in the picture. She's crying because she, her, which has happened to me, my cat is gone. Um, he went outside. Um, and you can get her to them to explain what's happening. You can use the present perfect. You can ask the person to write down the life experience of this person. Um, she has lost her husband, so she has no money. So she is feeling very sad, but she now has to go and work. Um, she has no one to let take care of her kids. It's a very sad story that they could have. Or the future symbol where you can ask a more advanced teacher to predict what's going to happen to this person in the future. Um, she she will um, have met a new friend. She she will have married him and she will have moved to a brand new house with a brand new car. So all these things that will have happened to her if her future is foretold. Okay, so those are things you can, what is happening, um, what has happened to this person, past tense, or what could happen to her. Same thing with this lovely picture, what is happening, what has happened, why are they so happy, what are they looking at on the phone, those are questions you could ask. So the what is happening is a lovely, delightful way to go and look at pictures, choose any picture from any magazine, and you can go and find out using the present continuous. Simply show them the picture and ask them what is happening, what are they doing, what are they thinking, and then there's a variety of pictures. People are on their way to a flight. What are they doing? Okay, They are going on holiday. What are they doing? They're waiting to board the, the plane. They are they are flying to Japan, wherever it might be. Um, <clears throat> the students are discussing their next essay. They are, um, they are sitting in the park. Okay. There's a lovely one as well. Um, what are they doing? They are looking at the horizon, thinking about when they will get married. They are... Have, they are um, drinking coffee, thinking about their future, sitting in the rain. Well, speaking of headlines, a lovely way that if you can get headlines from anything, um, you can link it to the content. You can also sp have speaking activities about that. Um, so if you have a look at all the magazines, they can you can list headlines and get them to match or look at a headline and tell them what they think the story is going to be. Um, topics, taking them back to the newspapers and yes, from the coronavirus time, there's uncertainty, there's vaccines, so financial. So you've got all of those, take one of them and give me three lines what you think the article is about. Um, there's climate change, car pollution, money, warnings, greenhouse effect, power, hurricane. What do you think the article is about? Tell you what you think is happening in the article. Yes, the war uh, with Putin and Russia and Ukraine, the big South African mixed up in it. Um, Russia versus USA, what is happening? Um, what will happen? What is going to happen? Um, here's the South African newspapers as well. Um, we need to stop grid the the grid collapsing. Okay, what do you think the story is about? Okay, um, heavy heavy rains wreck havoc. Okay, tell us about that. Arms in the mystery ship. So, what is happening? Tell us what it's about, or then get headlines and link it to other things. So, using pictures, finding the differences, getting two pictures. Say how they are the same and how they are different. Here yeah, we've got two pictures here. Yeah? <laughs> how are they the same? Um, they're both men. 
They're both smiling. They both got beards. Um, the ones were in a yamaka, I think. One doesn't have. Um, one is looking up. The one is looking down. One's got a blue shirt on. The one's got a beige shirt on. Um, they're looking in different directions. So you could you can compare and contrast them. You can say three things the same, three things different. Same thing is just are they same? They're all in the same team. They're in the same kit. They're all got their mouths open. What's different? One's only got a headband on. Only one's holding the ball. Um, they're all looking in different directions. So those are the kinds of things you would look at. What about these girls? Two in the same team. They both got their hair back. They're all wearing ponies. Only one's got the ball. They're all holding on together. So those are things that they're doing that are the same. Okay. So learners must do things. Um, you've got to get them to practice. Um, if you don't allow them to practice what they are doing, you are going to fail to get them a chance to actually apply their grammatic knowledge. So don't just you tell them. They must do something. Same as in the lesson plan conclusions. A lot of you just went over the lesson again. You never actually got your students to do something with that knowledge. So without successful strategies to use the grammar, these structures are quite useless on their own. So if you can... You can teach direct and indirect speech you blue in the face, but if you're not giving them an opportunity to practice it, um, it's quite useless. They'll soon forget what they were supposed to be doing. So hopefully these tips will encourage you to integrate grammar into various reading, speaking, listening, and writing contexts all across the spectrum. You just have to do something all the time. Please go look at Ferreira um, and differentiate between descriptive and prescriptive grammar. This is for you to go look at. Go to page 198, think about it. What is prescriptive grammar and what is descriptive grammar? Um, you can also use this to build up words and vocab, this kind of integrated contextualized approach. So if you look at this poem by, it's called the Washer Woman's Prayer by Azul Machani, and it goes just the four lines, to look at her hands, raw, knobby, and calloused. Look at her face, like a bean soaked, bean seed soaked in brine. Go to Ferreira, chapter 13, pages 199, 201, and look at what she suggests are strategies to help students remember words. If you think about this poem, think about the words like calloused and knobby, which are quite difficult words. Will students know what this means? How can we get them, what strategies can we use besides a dictionary to get them to understand these words? And can they be unpacked? Would you understand knobby and callous is just by looking at hands? Maybe you would, maybe you wouldn't. So what you could do is show them a picture. And this is a picture of knobbly hands. You can see they're uneven and there's parts that are raised, parts are down. So this would be a nice way to understand what knobbly means. Then you could do like a mind map. Um, what things could be knobbly, okay? Your hands could be knobbly, your knees, your knuckles, your ankles, your elbows, your toes, but also things like wood or surfaces can be knobbly if they're uneven and rough, okay? So that's and then they could possibly write a sentence or three sentences using knobbly with those sentences. But if you go to the dictionary, you'll see that there's also other information about knobbly, that the K is silent. Um, how do you write it? Get them to write the word to use it. Then if you're just looking at the word calloused, a good way is to show them the picture. There's the rush, rough washerman's hand or the hard sections on the hand. Um, then you can also get them to do a little mind map. What can be calloused? Okay, your heart can be calloused. Um, your hands, your feet, um, your elbows can be callous. Um, surfaces can be callous, especially if they're old. Um, so think about things that can be hard, figuratively and literally. That's quite a nice use of the word. And also remember to get them to write the words as well. This is the word callous. Um, pronounce it. Phonetically think about it. Use it. So you say, you're going away today, you will use the word knobbly and calloused in two sentences. Get them to practice it and go, keep on going over those words. Show me those calloused hands where your knobbly fingers. Um, so they get to use the word as well. So that brings me to the end of today. Um, remember, do something in everything in class you do. Don't just walk out with getting your learners not to do something. Get them to practice something. Get them to use things all the time. Um, Yes, if they're going to fall asleep in your class, to learn, students need to do something. So I've asked you to do a few things as well. Um, please go look at those tasks from Ferreira. They are relevant to SS1. Please refer to those. Um, asked you last week to, to think about designing a grammar task using an integrated approach. And this comes up in SS1 as well. So these are things that you could do which will prepare for SS1. But otherwise, I'm going to see you on Thursday. I think it's half past five. I'm not too sure talking about SS1, contextualized grammar assessment, 
If you have other issues or problems, please get back to me. But otherwise, wishing you a great semester two. And let's do this. Let's get through it. Okay. Ciao for now. Chat soon. Stay warm. Stay safe. Bye-bye.